Hi YouTubers, welcome to another video with me, your host, Zio. Today I've got some very interesting things to discuss with you, and it's been a while since I made a video, but I just wanted to go over some things with you uh, concerning this. This is uh, called an epicycle. It's what our solar system does right here. This is, you see it, that's our sun, and it's traveling around the Milky Way. Uh, it's pretty cool, some of the effects that I'm seeing here due to spatial compression along the equatorial plane of our galaxy. And that's something I really want to discuss today because there's some other effects that occur uh, when that happens. Admittedly, it's 33 million years across each one of these and 66 across two of them. So that's 33 million years and 33 million years as primary and secondary. The effects that I'm seeing on a long timeline are disturbing in some respects because what I'm seeing is increased volcanic activity, increased uh, asteroid movement, and movement of objects from the Oort cloud even. So it appears that space compresses at a different rate than matter. So the, the space of the solar system kind of does that, or at least there's a little burst as it travels towards the uh, epicycle or towards the equator of the black hole. Remember, that's a black hole in there. It's a perceived line of force uh, kind of effect. But it's a real thing, and as our solar system travels through it, space here is compressed. And it's just enough to make everything slightly heavier, I guess, if it were to be weighed somehow, but it, it essentially brings all the nuclei slightly closer together. And that weak force that attracts all matter towards itself or towards each other, I guess, that gravitational effect is increased as it travels through that point of pinch space. And there's layers that it travels through as it approaches that point. And that's kind of cool. We're going to be discussing some of that and how I'm able to see that in graphing from uh, increased activity of sunspots, for example, it's trackable through that over a long enough period you can see it. And as we approached the uh, last epicycle crossing of the galactic equatorial region, there were definitely peaks in solar cycles across vast scales across 11,000 years. You can see several large peaks. So let's go ahead and uh, start the presentation today. This is an a artist rendition of the Milky Way pretty accurate. Uh, this is the our sun traveling that way and you, as you can see as it goes around. This isn't entirely accurate. I have more accurate ones. This is more an artist rendition. Whoa, here's a big graph right here and here's where pretty much all the evidence of what I'm talking about really comes from and that's from geological records of craters, eruptions, craters, eruptions, different types and this odd effect down here. Now this black line is one that I've added with these dashes, and these dashes correspond with 33 million years and 66 million years, roughly, uh, across time. And that's that's very important because, as you can see, right here at 66, we have the major Chiklu Club, <laughs> Chiklu Lub, Chiklu Lub, Chik Lub, or something like that. Anyways, that was that major uh, asteroid or meteor strike that took out the dinosaurs. You see there's a major volcanic eruption as well, right on that line. And the fact that that came so close to that, I'm like, well, that's kind of strange. Now you look back here at the 32 or 33 million year mark, and you'll see that shortly after the last epicycle or equatorial crossing of the solar system, we have craters that exist shortly thereafter. So we, we've moved things in our solar system and eventually they hit the Earth. Now, admittedly, that's uh, probably a few million years later, same with these up here, either that or this graph is slightly off and it's not 33. Mm, you know, there might be some some fluctuations between the cycles. It may not be exactly 66. As you can see out here, there's some, some other close relations. Okay, we have here at the, at the next mark, we have 66, so we have, what is that, going to be 99 or 100 million years. You can see right there at the next cycle, there was another major crater that occurred right and you can see it, it looks like it's just before the the cycle or might be i think it might be right on so you can almost track 
these these epicycle crossings by the crossing. Now some of them don't have anything, but other ones. Look at this one. Here's another one. We got two more craters that are almost right on the dot at the 33. So we know that space compresses on these points, or I should say, gravity is temporarily increased as our solar system passes through the uh, galactic equator. And you can see there's there's the impacts, impacts, um, and it goes back. But you know, as as you travel further back, you know these are hundreds of millions of years. You're gonna have some some off lines like this one here. We got we got nothing here. But if you go a little bit ahead, this is where I'm thinking maybe maybe our radiocarbon dating is off a little bit because these cycles are very specific. Either that or we have a an oblong cycle to the way that the solar system travels through the edge of the galaxy and crosses that equatorial plane. Sometimes it would be shorter, sometimes it would be longer. It wouldn't be exactly 3366. Maybe there's an oblong cycle and a short cycle as well. Okay, so you see here on the, we're at 200 million here, 200 million years, 300 million years. That's about what, 210 million years right here? And this is the crossing, or the supposed crossing at 33 million. And then you see here, that's, uh, that's an event right there. That's the Jurassic Jurassic extinction line right there. And that was after or thereabouts it might be on the line. I'm, I'm thinking it's more on the line. If you see how these are all really close together, that's probably because those craters were the line most likely for this is going to line up with those a little bit closer. Um, the extinction event, uh, I don't, well, we have, we have a major eruption as well which is cause for concern. On matter of fact, we have another one there. That's, that's another uh, ex extinction line. These are all the colored lines are extinction lines, extinction barrier lines. And you can see there's a major volcanic eruption that seems to correspond with the crossing of the solar system through the equatorial plane of the galaxy. And that's due to spatial compression. Now, when you talk about spatial compression, why would that be? Because of the way space can compress and matter compresses at a slightly different rate. Take, for example, uranium-235. The nuclei of uranium-235, if brought closer together, they emit neutrons all the time. And if you bring them closer together, they become closer to criticality. It increases their chances of hitting each other. And of course, that's kind of what explains what's going on inside the Earth. Because when space compresses and the Earth travels through that compressed space, the uranium-235, which is kind of warming up our core, gets closer together and you have this uh, fission reaction. Even though it's not stated in the books, the core of the Earth is very laden with uranium-235 as well. It's, uh, mo uh, I guess, uh, regulated by molten, molten silicon and uh, supposedly an, an iron core that's spun. So, uh, we haven't seen any of that, but I, I can say that the reactions here and the reactions of compressed space lead me to believe that we definitely have a situation where we have a nuclear core that's being compressed by space as it travels through the galactic equator, and then shortly thereafter, not only do we have asteroid or craters from asteroids and meteor impacts, but we also have volcanic activities that seem to follow the line almost exactly. I mean, you look way over here, and we're 500 million years ago, and that's pretty close. I mean, there's some separation there, but did it take did it take that long for it to uh, to erupt? I'm gonna have to say no. I'm gonna say these lines are off a little bit. Either the cycle isn't perfectly 33 million years. Maybe it is in some places, but perhaps on the other side of the galaxy, it varies. Uh, all these black lines you see here, here, well, black lines here, 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 all the way across. Uh, those are your galactic epicycles when based upon our current readings and the last several cycles we can estimate what those cycles are. That's why I say the further you go back in time the entire cycle could have changed across this type of timeline. You're talking 500 million years and that's uh, that's a long long time. Um, we've got impacts with no craters back here that match this line pretty close to that one too. I think man, we're just off a little tiny bit and this is an extension line here. That's the the Devonian and Carboniferous extinction boundary. We've got all these other ones. This, we got uh, Carboniferous Permian. 
we got all these extinction lines that match up with these these uh, epicycle equatorial crossings. And like I said, it's uh, it just increased nuclear fission within the Earth from latent uranium that's in the core or near the core, surrounding the core, and you end up with these uh, fission cycles where you know all that magma gets hot and expands outward, and you get these huge eruptions that correspond with the compression of the nuclear fission reactor of the Earth. So this is something I kind of pieced together over the last couple years. Uh, that means since we just crossed one in 2012 that we're pretty much bound to get hit by smaller things that don't leave big giant craters that last for hundreds of millions of years. But there's going to be smaller uh, asteroids and rocks that are going to hit. Uh, and we've been seeing that increased increased meteors, increased asteroids coming very close to the Earth. Uh, and that's, that's just going to continue to increase until we probably get a big strike. Uh, there's, there's a chance for a big strike right on the crossing line or shortly thereafter. So we're pretty much due for it. Now, you can see some of these, you know, like uh, this strike, of course, happened just before that extinction. So that, they're, they're, but look at that. We got multiple strikes and we got a volcanic eruption right there, too. And that's pretty close to this line right here. So some of these lines are off. I'm thinking the cycle is not going to be a perfect sine wave in this case uh, because the, well, perhaps the, uh, uh, there were some changes inside our, our galactic core, you know, perhaps it, it ate something, you know, that caused a, a ripple effect across all the, the spiral arms and changed the cyclic period throughout time. So let's go to the next slide. Now here's another graph that shows the different relations across time where you have these different eruptions that are occurring very close to major impacts, like this here. We've got multiple eruptions, multiple craters. We have uh, changes in temperature, of course, when you have uh, increase in CO2. They're saying this before, but then you have a, a drop off here. That's usually from ash. That big drop off right there is usually from big, big events, like this one here you can see. It erupted, and then the temperature dropped. It erupted, and the temperature dropped. That's that's more, more what's been reported is is when major volcanoes erupt, you get major temperature drops, huge temperature drops, and uh, and that's that's something that's been seen on lots and lots of different uh, people's uh, research. Now you have major extinction events that are occurring in conjunction with those major volcanic events. Now, we can't stop volcanoes. Unfortunately, there's no way we can stop a volcano. And we've been seeing more and more uh, increased volcanic activity, more and more increased asteroid and meteor activity that's, that's close to the Earth and, and little meteor impacts and things like that. There, It's increasing. The number of earthquakes are increasing, too, here on Earth. So we know the magma's moving. We know it's pushing out in the outer plates, and it's the whole thing's moving more. And the reason why is because the fission reactor that is the core of the Earth has been spun up because all that uranium on, the, on a global scale was brought just a tiny bit closer, systemically. So now we had a runaway fission reaction, just for a, a period of time, which is gonna cause uh, increased volcanic activity, and eventually we're gonna get one of these big guys that are gonna go pow, and, and we're, gonna see, uh, we're gonna see a pretty big volcanic eruption pretty soon. We've already seen some in Indonesia, but that's just kinda like the, the icing on the cake. Um, there's some other events that occur when you have major volcanic activity. And that's changes in selenium levels in the oceans. Uh, it just, you know, all that volcanic ash just kind of washes it or absorbs a lot of the different minerals and drops them down to the bottom of the ocean. So you get this cleansing of selenium in the oceans, and that, of course, causes a major extinction event. And that's, that's due to these. Uh, there's also a sulfonation that occurs uh, that also, you know, sulfuric acid is not very good for water-bearing uh, creatures like ourselves or or creatures that live in water. They don't like living in sulfur gas, they like living in clean water. So sulfonation, uh, CO2, and of course, uh, a desalinization. That's selenite, selenium, taking that selenium out of the oceans. All right, let's go to the next uh, next slide. Uh, once again, I'm just gonna kind of review this. And like I said, this is caused by the epicycle of the solar system crossing the galactic plane. When that occurs, we get a systematic or systemic compression of our uranium-235 here on Earth, and it's probably detectable. They knew about it, they just didn't say anything about it because they're like, well, why is this all reacting, or, 
or why, why are our nuclear reactors more efficient right now? And then, of course, that would have dropped off as we crossed the 2012 barrier. But there's going to be surges as we travel through different barrier layers. Now, this one here shows what those barrier layers are. This is what I mentioned before. This is a sunspot number reconstruction filtered over three successive cycles for 210 years. Well, 210 year cycle. Now, actually, this, is, this goes back a bit further. This goes back to negative 8,000, 9,000 BC. So this is an 11,000 year graph. And as our solar system traveled through successive layers approaching the epicycle epi center or the, uh, the gravitational center of the galaxy, we have records of that, of how the structure of the galaxy's gravimetric, I guess, force lines are laid out because as our sun traveled through them, you're gonna have increased nuclear fusion inside the sun, which is gonna increase your sunspots. Everything can be traced backwards to these, these events. So you can see there were definitely one, two, three, four, and, and this is, I guess there's, it looks almost like there's a peak, but it's not as big as these other peaks. It's almost, uh, I guess it's the same. So we have an inner, inner area that has not necessarily the most energy in, in this form right here. It looks like just outside there's even more uh, binding energy just outside the center. And this, is, of course, is an 11,000 year transition towards the center, which this is the center of the galaxy, and this is about 11,000 years out. So we can look at that if we flip that around and we look at it, uh, then we can, we can see that that's, that's uh, what's going on there. Okay, so this is uh, something cool. Shows our uh, precession, eccentricity, solar forcing, and this is the stages of glaciation that occur. And this is across a thousand, so that's a million years. That's one million years, which, you know, that's a pretty big picture. Uh, we can get, we can see across a million years, we have cycles of hot, cycles of cold, and uh, they seem to correspond with these peaks as well. All the way across. say about that I mean other than it's uh, tied together right? okay so now we have something interesting this is angular momentum versus carbon 14 so the angular momentum of the earth maximum angular momentum table uh, the areas are selected from maximum momentum readings taken just before or after grand minimum opportunities except those marked so primarily what we're looking at is the grand minimum lines here anything below this these are ice ages that's a pretty big one right here, and this is today. So you look across time, you know, what was that, 9,000? Coming out of the Ice Age, we had a, we had a mini Ice Age there, but we came out into the sun. You know, the sun came out again, and it got really hot, as hot as it is today. Because these are sunspot numbers. Look at that, sunspots were way up. But look what happens right after that. We're gonna get this big dip. Well, is it gonna be this big dip, or is it just gonna be a little tiny dip and then, a, then up again? We're still unsure about that at this point. If we look classically, it usually drops a small amount. It doesn't drop all the way down the first time, but the second time it can. Look at that thing. Pow, right down into a glacier. And that's uh, a lot of this research in angular momentum versus carbon 14 is done to determine whether or not we're going, when and if we're gonna have another ice age. And you see we had some pretty, pretty cold times not too long ago. And that was on the approach. That's only like, uh, it's only like what, a thousand, thousand years ago, five hundred years ago, right there. So five hundred years ago, roughly about five, six hundred years ago, we had this uh, this cold period that we entered, and that would have been just outside the cusp of the uh, the point of uh, of highest mass uh, in the galaxy. Now this is interesting because this peak here that was nine thousand years ago indicates that we may have also been experiencing some type of burst, maybe a radial burst from, from, the, uh, from the center of our galaxy outward. Because all of these peaks, they have to be tied somehow into spatial compression. Every single one of them. You know, we do get a spin up on the fusion product or the fusion event inside the sun, but every single one of these peaks would be tied to spatial compression. Um, they're gonna be followed uh, 
by a period of cool off and that's going to also be your your period periodic fission cooling here of the planet earth after a spin up of the fission reactor within it and that's that's why you get hot and you get cold cycles here as well uh, temperature wise it's going to match the sun the sun sets the rate even even right now we have we have a slightly conflicting uh, battle going on between the sun the sun's output which is in a, a Miranda minimum or Mondra minimum or at least a minimal state right now it's gone to sleep in its 11 year cycle no sunspots right now uh, however in the near future we're going to have a lot of sunspots supposedly or we're going to go down into one of these troughs again and if we do go towards the trough I mean if you look at the trend trend down trend down trend down we should be trending upwards right now um, and that may be true because if you look at the 11,000 year cycle that we just looked at before we have to travel through those layers on the other side as well so you're gonna have peaks as we travel through those over the next 11,000 years uh, as we cross through those same layers on the opposite side of the galaxy so you're gonna have that on both sides and long before we reach the vacuous area up near the top of the sine wave and then even then, the sine wave is not like the first drawing as much as it is by, here, I'll show you a better one. Okay, so here, this one here is a, a kind of a drawing to show you that the galactic equator and the angle of ellipse. So 121, this is when we, or 1221 is when we crossed the, uh, the galactic equator. So that's what I'm trying to say. As we traveled across space we traveled through the equator of the galaxy which means we're in direct proximity or alignment to all the other matter not just the black hole but all the other matter that also shares that particular orbital line or that orbital path that equatorial orbit and they all have wobbles you know if we, if we looked at all these things they're all going like this around that uh, equatorial line it gives you some degrees and travel point anyway so, just wanted to show you that. That's a quick one. Okay, here's a much more accurate diagram. This diagram, it was a little difficult to find, but this shows the true periodic nature of the waveform going around the galaxy. And this is way more interesting. It's much more three-dimensional. It also gives uh, the difference in how bold stars uh, have different types of orbit, orbits. Uh, bold stars, of course, being down in this side. They have random orientations. Halo stars travel high above and far below the disk in orbits with random orientations. So we have randomness. This, this right here shows that we'll have some randomness or cyclic differences in the epicycle pattern seen of the solar system traveling through the galactic equator. So just right here we can see, honestly, you know, as, the, as our sun travels over and around these arms, they're going to vary in thickness. And I think that's going to vary in the, in the periodic time, which would explain the, some of the discrepancies in the hypothetical mathematic perfection of, you know, 33 million, 66 million, you know, all the way out 500 million years ago. Whereas you can see in 500 million years, that's going to, you know, it's going to be like a couple of orbits. That's going to be two orbits or almost two orbits around the uh, around the galaxy so you know that's the two orbits uh, is it gonna vary yeah it's gonna vary it's gonna vary even in one over it's gonna vary it doesn't it, there's there's nothing really saying it can't and by the look of this this is a great artist rendition showing that there is variance although there is a sine wave there is variance to how a solar system travels and orbits around a galaxy great great graphic I love this graphic it's my favorite graphic okay so here's a much more simplified version plane of the solar system we have the Sun inclined 63 degrees versus the galactic plane and here's the earth so pretty simple straightforward okay so stars in the local solar neighborhood move randomly relative to one another so we're right here and all these stars are kind of moving randomly now we're 27,000 light years from the core, and we have a 230 million year orbit of the sun around the galaxy, around the galaxy's black hole. 
So while the galaxy rotation carries them around the galactic center at even higher speed. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, pretty simple, straightforward. I just wanted to see that, you know, even though we're a star that travels in an orbit, these stars that are close to us all move in random orientations. I mean, look at this one's going this way, that one's going that way, that one's going that way. They're all over the place. They're almost like uh, molecules in the air. You know, molecules in the air have the same type of random orientation, if you've ever seen uh, graphs of how molecules move in the air. It's, it does come down to thermodynamics. It does come down to, you know, of course, uh, them bumping into each other and whatnot. Uh, charge, neutral charge, uh, positive, negative, all that other stuff. And, and also also mass and velocity. All these all these things come into the factors, even on star levels, of why they move the way they do, but you can see it's randomized uh, and they're caught in an orbit. In this case, our sun has a an assumed 230 million, or calculated 230 million year orbit around the galactic center. So again, this one's saying 28,000, but still 230, and it just shows once again artist rendition of the sun going around our galaxy. Now this one's kind of cool. This one uh, shows the 60 million year cycle transit of the solar system above and below the plane of our galaxy. And uh, see the 140 million year cycle transit of our solar system through our galaxy's spiral arms. So you can see here it's got the, uh, the 60 million. So I guess they're saying it's 30 million for each, uh, for each pass through the, uh, the galactic plane. So we have Rate of sedimentation, continental freeboard volcanism, which looks like it occurs. Looks like it's happening on. Huh. Uh, this, if this is the uh, periodic, I'm not seeing where the crossing point is. Let's see. Peak. Yeah, my my trip. This is this is peak peak. It should, we shouldn't have volcanism at the furthest reaches of the epicycle. I've been finding that the, the peaks for the volcanism or volcano activity appears to be directly related to the travel through the equatorial plane. So now admittedly we have this right here, sea surface temperatures appear to follow that as well. Uh, that's, that's an almost perfect match right there so I can see why they like that one. We have cosmic radiation flux, which eh, you can see a couple of peaks, yeah, peaks line up here. Okay, that's cool. Um, biodiversity, of course, ebbs and flows. Now we have, this is uh, showing the peak. So the peak must, that must be like when we travel through it. Because this would be right after. Travel through it and right after. Uh, travel through it right after, travel through it right after. So. The peak would be traveling through it, and I guess that would be right afterwards, because that's that fits more with the data that I've been finding. Um, see, they've matched it up here. Uh, we have a now. This is a trough, though. That maybe that's as it passes through the other direction. We had that one. So this one doesn't make a lot of sense on this, unless that's traveling through the equatorial region. So this graph may not be. 100% correct. They may not have done quite enough to, uh, research on this one, and they're just trying to like kind of compile it all as quickly as they can, kind of thing. Um, but then again, you know, uh, you know, there it is for what it is. It doesn't appear to be. I mean, we've got some some alignments here, but this activity here kind of throws it off a little bit. I'm not I'm not sure if this is uh, correctly. Okay, so we have our, this is another version, or another view of our galaxy. We have our sun going around. Most of the planets found to date lie within about 300 light years from our sun. So just this little tiny circle right here. And that's, you know, uh, according to some of the most recent data that I've read online, there are one trillion stars in our galaxy. Now, I've seen different numbers. Uh, eight, ten years ago, or not, sorry, 20 years ago, they said there were 300, 300 billion 300, 300,000 billion? 300,000 billion, I think. Yeah, I think it's 300,000 billion. Anyways, and then recently it was 100,000. 300 billion, 100, yeah, so 300 billion, 100 billion. See, that's not, that's not the same as a trillion. So 
the most recent data that I've seen says one trillion. I'm not sure what they're trying to prove, but there's some other facts about our galaxy you may not know. Uh, facts about our galaxy are, are any galaxy, I should say. 99.999% of all the stars out there in the universe are G-class stars, just like our star, in different stages of evolution, of, or I should say completion of uh, their fusion envelope. So we got this going on here. Uh, let's, let's go on. There's, there's some more celestial equator, elliptic equator. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Here's another viewpoint of the path around the Milky Way. And these are your angles. Here's the Earth with its angle of incidence to the sun. And of course, the sun's pole here, North Pole. So it's inclined, and I guess the direction it travels is that. So this is a great graphic that shows uh, that the sun is traveling through, or it looks like it's very, very close. It doesn't travel that far away from the equatorial zero line of the Milky Way. So that's that's interesting. That's a lot better. This this one we've got angles and degrees and everything. So this one's probably more correct, even though it says diagram not to scale. Of course, it's not to scale, but I would say the uh, maybe maybe the sine waves are a little bit more correct. All that other artist rendition. That one looked really correct to me. This one, of course, it's got angles on it, but I don't see any, I don't see the, uh, the angles here. Uh, they, they don't have those marked out. So this sine wave here, the white line may not be correct, but for now, let's just, just go ahead and go with it and uh, move on. We've got more important stuff to talk about anyways. In another view of the galaxy, orientation map, there's the sun, there's the Orion Nebula. It just shows different things that we would recognize, but it's not really important to what we're talking about. Sun's approximate orbit around the Milky Way, a 230 million year orbit. Okay, once then, I'm going to go back to this and I want to talk about the, uh, the volcanoes that occur because of the traveling of the, of the solar system through the equatorial plane, increasing the fission envelope yield inside the Earth and also causing all the rocks in our solar system to move around and get sucked into orbits that that bring them closer to the sun. Of course, when they get closer to the sun, they tend to run into us. So that's not good, and we're just going to have to kind of deal with that as we go. All right, here's a, an interesting, nice graphic of the Earth and its magnetosphere, uh, entry regions, and you know, it's just like most of the stuff is going to get de deflected around it through the uh, the shock bow here. Uh, but you can see. You know, there's there's places they can get through. I imagine they're they're coming in here and right here. Yeah, that's where we're getting the entry. So, either way, um, it is possible to hit the Earth. There, you know, we don't have a perfect magnetosphere, and also if rocks are traveling fast enough, they're just going to bust right through it anyways. Okay, this is a picture, a pretty recent one, 2019, of the known uh, large. I guess asteroids around uh, us right now and, and if this were this is actually a an animation that we'd be able to see all this stuff moving and, and I can't turn it on right now but just understand all these things move and, and all these little dots are moving in and out in and out in and out like this and you know it's just it's just a crazy madhouse and what happens when the solar system passes through the galactic plane all the changes just a tiny bit so you start getting little collisions of all these asteroids out here and they start hitting each other or they change their orbit a little bit and so this this giant web now everything within this web is orbiting most of it's orbiting the sun or it's in orbits that bounce off of our own planets here you know large planets there's but that's a lot of asteroids to be worried about and all that stuff just moved December 21st, 2012. It just every bit of that moved. Just a tiny bit. But in space, a tiny bit's all you need. I mean, this is, this is going to be like a shooting gallery out here. And we're probably detecting that now. Uh, if we were to get hit by an asteroid here or a meteor here, it was big, uh, most likely 75% chance it's going to hit water. So you're talking tsunamis. You don't want to live, you know, down low. You want to get up in the mountains. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking about preparation but then again you know it could be a long long time before anything hits however I don't think that's the case we're seeing a lot of increased uh, meteors and asteroids that are getting very close to the earth and uh, that means that all this stuff has shifted and you know as a species we should be more focused on 
developing defense systems. I mean, look at how many, these are all of our, those are our enemies, every one of these things. We should mine them and take the money out of them and build stuff out in space with them, not, not wait and be subject to the, to the terribleness of, of an extinction event from these things. Of course, we got the volcanoes too. Volcanoes can do just as much, if not more damage to our planet by killing our seas and dropping the temperatures and creating ice ages and all kinds of stuff. So uh, this is this is our our battle map, as it were. There's a lot more enemies out there than just a couple people with, you know, uh, weapons of mass destruction and stuff like that. So and here's another view of the asteroids. And of course, this one's an animation too. Of course, I don't have it running, but all this stuff moves in and out. And, and that's just, it's just crazy when you think about how many asteroids are out there, how many near Earth asteroids. This is our orbit here. We got uh, Mercury, Venus, and I believe this is Mars. This is Earth, the blue one. And you can see, even though we pretty much travel, all these things are crossing our orbit. And all it takes is, is some of these stuff here to bump into it, and bump into it, bump into it. And like I said, the whole thing changed. All the orientation, if you were to go back to, to 2000, well, you might not be able to see it though, because it's gonna be, it's gonna correspond with the high levels of compression that the sun experienced as it traveled through the increased uh, compression layers of the galaxy, as it traveled through those past, that, that, uh, that carbon-14 11,000 year shot that we saw. So we could probably look at those peaks and compare them here and, and find uh, definite correlations with those. Okay, these are major impacts, and of course they're done by age. Now you know the big one here, that was the one that killed the dinosaurs. And that was uh, uh, 66 million years ago. Now, I've been looking at the impact, and I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in how that impacted, because in my opinion it came in like this and dug out, just literally dug out the, the Gulf of Mexico. Just bam, and, poof, and, and knocked all that crap up here. And, so that could be a lot of the sedimentation and stuff. Just blew it up there. And we found debris, impact debris, way over here. So I know that's true. So it pretty much scooped out the uh, Gulf of Mexico, that the impact event. So that's pretty major. Uh, there's some other things that happened. Right around that time, that's when all these continents broke up. So it's probably big enough to crack the, the continental crust of the Earth. And then, of course, you know, everything's spread apart because that's what things do. All right, but these are different major events. You know, we have some, some big ones, some small ones. You see some that go way back. Uh, this is a billion years ago in dash purple. We have this a billion years ago. These are, I guess, a billion years ago. These are a billion years ago. All these dash purples are a billion years ago. Uh, half a billion years ago, 400 million years ago, that's that one, these dash blues. So this stuff does happen, and I've been finding, like I said, correlation between the equatorial crossing and these events. Here's something interesting that not a lot of you probably know about. This is Jupiter and its orbit around the sun and it pushes and carries entire fields of asteroids with it. So it's moving around and it's got these battering rams and essentially it's it's sweeping everything that would come in within range of this thing. It's a giant web gravimetrically attracted web, and you can see these are all part of that thing. And this is an animation too. I wish I could run these animations, that'd be cool. Uh, but I'll just tell you that it moves around in orbit and it carries or drags these uh, large groups of asteroids around with it. It's kind of cool. Uh, but all of those would change as well during a compression event, uh, which of course that was what traveling towards and through our galactic equator, that's what we ended up with. So all these things have now shifted orbit a little tiny bit. We may not be able to register it, but I bet we can. And that's one of the things I'm not seeing in the news. There's not a lot of chit chat when it comes to major things that, that we're probably seeing with our, with our observation, our telescopes and things like that. We're like, wow, those things are all off by like, you know, however fraction of a degree, but they're still moving. Here's another one. These are, let's see, which ones are these? These ones are, I think these are comets. Of course, they, need, they don't move it, but yeah, those are comets and there's, there's a, uh, this is the, the belt of Oort cloud objects. The, the Kuiper belt? Yeah, anyways. 
Can't they name this like something? I don't know. Anyways. So out past Neptune, we have this big giant belt. And all these things were affected by the galactic cross. So we, we're going to have stuff moving around out here, too, that's going to eventually translate into objects that are going to move into the inner sections of the solar system. Now, classically, if we go back with the, uh, the chart, we can see that we did have uh, comet strikes. We did have asteroid strikes. Were they, was it, was it a, a situation where the, these were just unaffected by it and only the stuff on the inside was affected by it? That could be, that could be it too. But we could still have comets. Anything that bumps out here and gets caught by, by one of these giants, it can move around. So compression, you know, you got Pluto that's punching through this belt all the time. If the orientation of the belt were to change as Pluto went through, uh, it's, it's going to move them around. So once again, let's look at this. We see that uh, our transition through the equatorial plane has caused multiple eruptions and craters to occur. They were very close to that time. 